Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be looking at part two of Gilles and Félix Guattari's What is Philosophy? This second part is titled Philosophy, Science, Logic, and Art. And of particular importance here is taking what has been said about philosophy so far and expanding this to the other fields, particularly science and art, in describing how do they confront chaos and how do they construct a plane that is specific to that discipline's mode of function. In part five of this text, which I guess really this is the first part of the second half of the book, functives and concepts, Deleuze and Guattari state that for science, it functions and is defined not by concepts, but by functions or propositions. And functions and propositions, at least in the way that they're being used here, has a sort of derogatory connotation because it imposes limits upon chaos as a way to understand it. And chaos is perhaps the most important subject of the second half of this work. It is about how to respond to chaos and how to draw a movable territory, as it's called in A Thousand Plateaus. They write here on page 118, Chaos is defined not so much by its disorder as by the infinite speed with which every form taking shape in it vanishes. It is a void that is not a nothingness, but a virtual, containing all possible particles and drawing out all possible forms, which spring up only to disappear immediately, without consistency or reference, without consequence. Chaos is an infinite speed of birth and disappearance. And it's important to note how this chaos is a productive force. It doesn't work by negation or by destruction, but by the eternal return, as Deleuze talks about it in Difference and Repetition. We can almost think of this as the opposite of death as it appears in Heidegger's philosophy. Now, for Heidegger, death is the possibility of impossibility as such. Here, chaos is the possibility of possibility as such. It's the possibility of change, of fruition, of creation. So chaos has this infinite speed where it has the potential to act on any number of things in an incorporeal and instantaneous manner. So chaos has a virtual quality to it. And the job of the creative individual is to take this chaos and give it consistency. Because, once again, the, this word consistency is featured throughout this text, among others of theirs. And consistency kind of has two connotations. You have consistency as in repetition, like I consistently read or work out or, you know, eat, whatever it may be. But then you can also think of consistency like the consistency of a fluid. It's like a texture thing. It's a, um, a tangibility of something. And that tangibility is necessarily going to be limited once it becomes actualized. Once chaos becomes actualized, the goal of the creative individual is to actualize it in a way where it doesn't become stagnant, where it prompts some further becoming, some further change. And the problem the and Guattari see with science is that it works on basically trying to slow down chaos, and defining it by position, energy, mass, spin value. It's sort of a, um, a slowing down in a sort of conceptual sense. And this creates a problem for them because it focuses on creativity as a question of determination, which has a connotation of imposition, right? Of determining, for example say you're like a sovereign of a state, determining in what manner your citizens can move. 
determination acts upon variables, and it requires distinct formations of these variables in order to make sense of it. So Deleuze and Guattari's problem with science is that it operates on a sort of normalized complacency where instead of drawing a line of flight, of extracting and drawing a creative path, science actualizes very concrete functions from a set of referable, simple states of affairs. It operates on a sort of metaphysical reduction of creativity to determinacy, which, of course, many philosophers have called this into question with, for example, the uh, advent of quantum mechanics and you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and whatnot. And this functives and concepts chapter is just particularly challenging. There's so much going on here that I don't understand at all. So to conclude it in a relatively quick manner, I'll just outline for you some of the basic differentiations they make between philosophy and science. Now, the kind of theme of philosophy, science, and art is that it works by operating on a plane. Now, philosophy operates and draws and reacts on a plane of imminence. So, what something is, what it means, is imminent to the conditions and is not transcendent. Now, science operates by a plane or system of reference. It tries to make things still and distilled down into, think of like a Cartesian coordinate plane, like your XY coordinate plane. It works by looking at what something is in reference to a very ordered set that is superimposed over them and that is constitutive of their identity. Philosophy works on inseparable variations. Think of these like intensive differences. So these are like intensities, um, as Deleuze talks about them in Difference and Repetition. Whereas science works on independent variables. So the difference here is between the inseparability of, you know, a, a great example I like to use is a dog peeing around a perimeter in such a way that it represents a territorial behavior. In fact, it is a territorial behavior. It signals something, and it becomes expressive. Now, philosophy is going to look at all these different factors and different flows as inseparable variations of a common milieu. But science is going to try to extract independent variables. It is trying to extract concrete values even if they vary, you know, it will, it will round or it will simplify to some extent in order to try to manipulate and try to, you know, like this is how experimentation works. You have to have a dependent, independent variable or variables, and you can manipulate these variables to see how it changes the world. And humans kind of act as a mediator between chaos and being or expressivity or, you know, sense. So once again, science here takes on a sort of presumptuous character of interfering in the mode of simplification. And then lastly, philosophy works on concepts and science on functions. We basically already talked about that. But one of the commonalities between them is problems. They both confront the universe and reality and, you know, metaphysics as a question of problems to be solved. So in that way, they do have some commonality. Now, in this second part, prospects and concepts, they're talking a lot about logic. And there's lots of stuff that just goes over my head here, but I've got enough to kind of maybe help you ground yourself in this very complex text. And what they're looking at here is they start by looking at Gödel's incompleteness theorem. 
and they write here on page 137, according to the two aspects of Gödel's theorem, proof of the consistency of arithmetic cannot be represented within the system. There is no endoconsistency. And the system necessarily comes up against true statements that are nevertheless not demonstrable, are undecidable. There is no exoconsistency, or the consistent system cannot be complete. In short, in becoming propositional, the concept loses all the characteristics it possessed as philosophical concepts. Its self-reference, its endoconsistency, and its exoconsistency. This is because a regime of independence, of variables, axioms, and undecidable propositions, has replaced that of inseparability. Even possible worlds as conditions of reference are cut off from the concept of the other person that would give them consistency. And continuing on, they mention that the notion of a function, especially in logic, inevitably deprives it of all its specific characteristics that referred back to another dimension. And, you know, this is a fundamental part of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, is that every logical system runs up against its own incompleteness, its own impotence, with regards to true statements that aren't demonstrable within that system. These are presuppositions. And everything requires presuppositions. For example, if I want to say, this table is brown, I presuppose the law of non-contradiction, namely that this table cannot be brown and not brown at the same time and in the same respect. And you might ask, well, why must I presuppose that? And we must simply say, well, we don't know how to think without assuming these presuppositions. We can't even really talk about a possible world beyond that presupposition because our thinking itself depends on being bound by those presuppositions in a way where when we try to formalize a system, we inevitably run into presuppositions which, if we try to present the system we're in as if it is the absolute truth with a capital T, we run into the fact that there is another dimension upon which our system depends, yet nevertheless which we cannot totalize or formalize. So as a result, logic for Deleuze and Guattari, is the paradigm of thinking that binarizes reality into definite, already constituted states of affairs, of true or false, which are said to be exhausted in themselves. And the reason Deleuze and Guattari have a problem with this is because they say here on page 140 that the concept is reborn because it is not a scientific function and because it is not a logical proposition. It does not belong to a discursive system, and it does not have a reference. The concept shows itself and does nothing but show itself. Concepts are really monsters that are reborn from their fragments. And it might be helpful to go to the previous lecture, if you haven't, to learn a little bit about endoconsistency versus exoconsistency, and even then I didn't, you know, cover it to its fullest extent because it's a rather complicated concept that I think it's better just to read about. But concepts have a way of transmitting something, and it's not information, but rather for art, you know, this would be sensations or affects. It presents something in a way that is incorporeal and immediate. In the case of art, for example, this is the translation of the I feel, which isn't mediated, but rather is a sensation that is linked to and merges into a new sensation. So concepts have this power of the monster, really, to go beyond their fragments. And this is something that Deleuze and Guattari think logic problematizes. Because 
even when it's trying to talk about a real system, it speaks of the lived for them as a sort of empty variable of a system of logical functions or functives. Now, one of the more important contributions that they make here, not only in this whole work, but specifically in this chapter, is on the event. And they're trying to get away from states of affairs precisely because of the way we've been talking about logic so far. Logic and science both operate on states of affairs in a way which tends to assume a false exhaustibility. Deleuze and Guattari write here on page 156 that the event is immaterial, incorporeal, unbelievable, pure reserve. Now you might be like, what is that? I think one of the best ways to understand the event is to understand speech act theory or performative speech acts. A great example that Deleuze and Guattari like to use is the order word, I declare war. Now, what happens when a sovereign says, I declare war? In an instant, the whole of the kingdom or nation or state to which their rule applies, and even beyond it as it trickles out into spheres of influence, is affected instantaneously and incorporeally. Because one may think, well, well, what really changes when, I don't know, when the U.S. declares war on Vietnam, for example? You know, what really changes there? And really, it's nothing material. That's why the event is immaterial. And it is incorporeal because it's not delivered in any body, at least no material body, but rather it is embodied in a speech act which has the power through this reserve of sense or expression, which makes it what it is, has the power to change minds, to change states of affairs and craft a future through a speech act. And a speech act is special because, for example, when I say the table is brown, my speech is referring to a referent outside of my speech. But in a speech act, like I declare war, it is self-referential. It is performative, which is to say it creates its own reference through its utterance. And thus, there's something very particular about the event, which is the virtual register. And I think a great way to think about what the virtual is, is to keep in mind May 68, as I read the following passage from page 157. Virtuality goes beyond any possible function. In the conversational words attributable to a scientist, the event doesn't care where it is, and moreover, it doesn't care how long it's been going, so that art and even philosophy may apprehend it better than science. The event that is a meanwhile, an entretemps, the meanwhile is not part of the eternal, but neither is it part of time. It belongs to becoming. The meanwhile, the event, is always a dead time. It is there where nothing takes place, an infinite awaiting that is already infinitely past awaiting and reserve. This dead time does not come after what happens. It coexists with the instant or time of the accident but as the immensity of the empty time in which we see it as still to come and has having already happened in the strange indifference of an intellectual intuition. All the meanwhiles are superimposed on one another, whereas times succeed each other. So there's something very interesting happening here in an event, and we can think of May 68. So for those who aren't aware of May 68, May 68 was this huge movement that was taking place in France 
And it was a primarily student-led movement in its infancy, and it was aimed at restructuring the authoritarian structure of the French university. There were a number of French universities who were being or which were being built in very low-income areas and were taking in lots of new students that they had never been taking in before. And yet there was kind of this classism that was rampant and an unwillingness to accommodate students and to relinquish some of the hierarchical power that had been in place in the French university. And as a result, throughout the month of May in 1968 in France, nearly a quarter of the entire French population was actively engaged in uprisings, protests, strikes, whatever it may be. And Deleuze and Guattari have written on May 68. In fact, I covered their essay, May 68 Did Not Take Place, on my channel. And in that essay they are problematizing the notion of taking place. They look at the way in which historians, at least in the abstract, have talked about May 68, and they mention that historians like to pretend as if events are exhaustible, but really the explanations of May 68 in this historically totalizing manner were ad hoc. They came up after the fact, and they tried to establish, just in the naming of May 68, for example, that it happened in an isolated time, when in fact it had precedent before and after, and you know it interacted with all sorts of other protest movements and spilled into things. So there's always an element of accident, indifference, and intuition in the event that goes beyond our ability to totalize it, to understand it in a scientific manner, in the sense that history can be said to be a science. So the event has a stubborn obstinacy to authority, whether that be logical authority or rational authority. And the reason the event is a dead time is because nothing takes place strictly speaking, but rather things become. This is like when Deleuze and Guattari talk about a third person, that the I is always a third person, not the self or the other. This is kind of what is being gotten at, is in the sense of the event, it establishes a reserve, just like a speech act does, where when the sovereign states, I declare war, it sort of retroactively creates its own foundations of, oh, we're in war and we just now realized it, or it just became official, but we were already in war. It kind of creates an infinite past, which acts as reserve for a future that is yet to become, or that is yet to be. And as such, it is actively becoming. They write here on page 159, there is a dignity of the event that has always been inseparable from philosophy as amor fati, and that's love of fate in Latin. Being equal to the event or becoming the offspring of one's own events. My wound existed before me. I was born to embody it. I was born to embody it as event because I was able to disembody it as state of affairs or lived situation. There is no other ethic than amor fati in philosophy. Philosophy is always meanwhile. And really, this to me is what Foucault meant when he said that anti-Oedipus was one of the first genuine pieces of ethics of the 20th century. It is an ethic of of a lived revolution, of an eternal return, which has a sort of fate, but the only fate as being to create, to become new. Now in this third subchapter called Percept, Affect, and Concept, the focus is primarily on art. 
And art is really interesting. You know, they're talking about art like aesthetics. Not only is this visual art, but this is architecture and music and theater. And they write here that a percept is independent of the creator through the self-positing of the created, which is preserved in itself. What is preserved, the thing or the work of art, is a block of sensations, that is to say, a compound of percepts and affects. Percepts are no longer perceptions. They are independent of a state of those who experience them. Affects are no longer feelings or affectations. They go beyond the strength of those who undergo them. Sensations, percepts, and affects are beings whose validity lies in themselves and exceeds any lived. So, this is a common theme throughout Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy. Is, For example, they say something must always spill from the box in A Thousand Plateaus, which is to basically say no system can ever be totalized. There's always a line of flight to be drawn, something that surpasses the lived insofar it is, as it is the now, and constitutes a future, just like the event does, and retroactively alters the past. Just like when, you know, I don't know, when 9-11 happens, and that retroactively changes the way we think about the war in Afghanistan, for example. So an event has the power to bypass time in an infinite, immaterial, incorporeal transformation. And this is one of the powers of art, is that it uses sensations, percepts, and affects to communicate, or rather to force, a becoming. They mention the way that art uses material, whether this is, I think architecture is a really good way for thinking about material, um, especially like brutalist architecture, which focuses on this brute expressivity of materials themselves. Deleuze and Guattari write on page 167, all the material becomes expressive in art, that being. It is the affect that is metallic, crystalline, stony, and so on. That is why those who are nothing but painters are also more than painters, because they bring before us, in front of the fixed canvas, not the resemblance but the pure sensation of a tortured flower, of a landscape slashed, pressed, and plowed, giving back the water of the painting to nature. And however strong an artist's interest in science a compound of sensations will never be mistaken for the mixtures of material that science determines in states of affairs. So they specify here in this kind of subsection of the subsection that art works by extracting a block of sensations, a pure being of sensations. Now what exactly does that mean? That means that, for example, when a piece of brutalist architecture assails one's senses and one gazes upon it and contemplates it and whatnot, the material itself has an expressivity. It expresses some sort of feeling to you, and that feeling is itself metallic. So metallic is not a feeling, but feeling becomes metallic. So feeling or affect or sensation is the medium by which art transmits controlled chaos, a block of sensations. And block is B-L-O-C. So you, know, you could think of like the black block too of Antifa, for example. So, in the case of art, and this is a point that they touched on in Anti-Oedipus, but I really like an example that, that will help make sense of this that Graham Harmon talks about all the time. Graham Harmon is a speculative realist, or he wrote Object-Oriented Ontology, which is a very interesting work. 
And he cites an instance in which Daniel Dennett, who's a famous American philosopher, um, you know, specializes in biology and philosophy of science and logic. Dennett cites a wine taster who, in describing a wine, says a flamboyant and velvety Pinot, but lacking in stamina. And Dennett says wine tasting is just a bunch of, you know, people making up stuff. We would be much better off figuring out what wine is actually like, what's the best wine, by spitting it into a machine that spits back a chemical formula. But the problem here is that in the case of the affect or the expressivity that we get from a piece of architecture, it does not resemble a chemical formula. It does not resemble an atom. So when I say that a piece of brutalist architecture makes me feel astute, makes me feel grounded, makes me feel nervous, makes me feel compelled. None of those feelings are in the chemical properties of the brutalist architecture. You will never be able to find fear, for example, in a chemical formula because it is emergent from that formula. You know, it's, it's the result of interacting with material things, but it is not a question of resembling that thing. The Les Inquateries state quite funnily, but I think it's a great example, the difference between breasts and the feeling of having breasts. So, you know, breasts are a hunk of flesh and different sensory perceptors and whatnot. It is this material thing. But the feeling of having breasts can be empowering or nerve-wracking or uncanny, or heavy, or unsure. And there is nothing empowering about a atom. There's nothing about an atom that screams empowering. But rather, it is the transmission of a pure sensation, which is art's kind of the thing it does so well, that makes art what it is, that makes it different from just spitting out a chemical formula. Because flamboyance, right, an atom can only be so flamboyant. It can only be such by analogy or metaphor. But it can't be flamboyant because an atom is not flamboyant. It is an atom, right? So this is a very, very fundamental ontological distinction. But it's one which grounds their theory of affect when they say here on page 169 that affects are precisely these non-human becomings of man, just as percepts, including the town, are non-human landscapes of nature. So an affect is not something that comes from the human, but it comes from a beyond. It comes from a chaos which is understood, contemplated, perceived, and it affects one in ways that don't reduce to something one has already seen, but rather they're something new. And it's important to keep in mind that this idea of getting to the affects of things, it can risk sounding conservative, like when Heidegger talks about us getting away from inauthenticity and getting back to authenticity. One can read that in such a way where it appears to be a conservative return, a sort of boxing oneself in. But really, this is not a conservative, but a constitutive function. Let me elaborate here by reading from page 174. The affect certainly does not undertake a return to origins, as if beneath civilization we would rediscover, in terms of resemblance, the persistence of a bestial or primitive humanity. It is within our civilization's temperate surroundings that equatorial or glacial zones, which avoid the differentiation of genus, sex, orders, and kingdoms, 
currently function and prosper. It is a question only of ourselves here and now. But what is animal, vegetable, material, or human in us is now indistinct, even though we ourselves will especially acquire distinction. The maximum determination comes from this block of neighborhood, like a flash. So, an affect, right, because it's incorporeal and in, uh, instantaneous, it travels at an infinite speed. It travels as a flash, as is said here. But these affects, because they don't reduce to things we are, affects are post-human. So, affects don't reduce to the canny feeling of jealousy that I know, for example, a jealousy that I'm used to, or a fear that I'm used to. But rather, the affect, as it is presented in art, presents us with something new, similar to when Deleuze and Guattari say, the artist is always adding new varieties to the world. So the affect necessarily brings us out of ourselves precisely by dissolving some of the sureties of things we've already known. They provide us with something that doesn't resemble something we've already seen. It is, in fact, something different and something new. And if you want to understand this a little bit better, particularly difference, read Deleuze's Difference and Repetition, because there's a lot of particularity about the way that difference is used in here that would be aided by that text. Now, in terms of discussing and understanding art, because, like I said before, one of the main focuses is on chaos, Deleuze and Guattari use the analogy of building a house to talk about understanding art. And this house can be understood as, of course, something that has been created, but we can think of it as territory in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy. Territory has a number of things that it's trying to accomplish. It's trying to be stable. It's trying to stave off chaos. But it also is expressive. Just in the case of the territory becomes expressive through the territorial behavior of the dog peeing around the perimeter, suddenly the territory itself becomes not just a plot of land, but it becomes the dog's territory. They write here on page 182 that the house does not shelter us from cosmic forces, and cosmic and chaos, can, they're virtually synonymous here. At most, it filters and selects them. Sometimes it turns them into benevolent forces. Archimedes' force, the force of the water's pressure on a graceful body floating in the bath of the house, has never been made visible in painting in the way that Bernard succeeded in doing in Le Nou Alban. And I think that's how you pronounce it, but you can see the painting on screen here, which, you know, just the way that it uses colors, it's very specific to me. And I think it's a really great painting that they chose to highlight here. Because it is presenting us with a unique affect. There's something, sure, there's something beautiful about this body, but there's also something somber, something uncanny, something almost ugly and inhuman, which is exactly the post humanism that an affect is. It takes us beyond our conception of human as stable territory, as a stable house. By constructing a new house, by constructing a new territory, by presenting a new affect, by contemplating a new affect, we come outside of ourselves in something that has never yet been made visible. And I think in order to help understand not only the expressivity of art, but the expressivity of non-human things, and the way things grow to make sense, I think it's really helpful to look at the territorial behavior of animals, which we've touched on before, and we've touched on in this video. 
but they sketch it out in more detail here on page 184. They write that this emergence of pure sensory qualities is already art, not only in the treatment of external materials, but in the body's postures and colors, in the songs and cries that mark out the territory. It is an outpouring of features, colors, and sounds that are inseparable insofar as they become expressive. This is the philosophical concept of territory. Right? That's, that's super important on its own, that territory is expressive. That is what the concept of territory is. is it is an expressive and inseparable milieu. But continuing on, they write, Every morning, the Sina Poetis Dendirostris, this is the tooth-billed bower bird, a bird of the Australian rainforest, cuts leaves, makes them fall to the ground, and turns them over so that the paler internal side contrasts with the earth. In this way, it constructs a stage for itself, like a ready-made. And directly above, on a creeper or a branch, while fluffing out the feathers behind its beak to reveal their yellow roots, it sings a complex song made up from its own notes and, at intervals, those of other birds that it intimates. It is a complete artist. And this example of the tooth-billed bowerbird is really, really interesting because when you listen to its call, it's very varied and it's constantly changing. And when you look at some of the scientific literature on the mating practices of the tooth-billed bowerbird, this sort of situation that it lays out with the leaves is called a stage court. And I think that's really interesting because it has connotations of theater. And interestingly, to add to the information that Deleuze and Guattari talked about, the bowerbird removes old leaf from the court, and a court is chosen if and only if it has a suitable branch near the leaves that have been placed for the female to perch on. And not only that, but like they mentioned, it has to have a branch on high from which the male can look down and wait for a female to come. And then the male drops from on high and displays its territorial behavior. So there's something terribly creative about all of this, none of which is human. It is its own self-sufficient act of expression. But it teaches us something about, you know, about how behaviors work, about how something becomes expressive. And to elaborate on what it means to become expressive, they write that all that is needed to produce art is here. A house, some postures, colors, and songs, on condition that it all opens onto and launches itself on a mad vector, as on a wish's broom a line of the universe of de- or of deterritorialization. And cited here is Paul Klee's perspective on a room with occupants. And I think this is a really interesting painting to have in the back of our minds when we're thinking about these expressive behaviors, is we have all these heterogeneous elements, but they all act through these transverse lines and through different angles and through depth and texture, all of them come together to produce something that is inseparable in itself and focuses on building a stage or court. And just in the way that the stage court of the tooth-billed bowerbird testifies to some of its creative and unique capabilities, so too does the perspective on a room with occupants allow Klee to tell us something just like the bird does? And in terms of confronting some of the reductive possibilities that are present in science and in logic, Deleuze and Guattari say here on page 195 that from literature to music, a material thickness is affirmed that does not allow itself to be reduced to any formal depth. 
It is a characteristic of modern literature for words and syntax to rise up into the plane of composition and hollow it out rather than carry out the operation of putting it into perspective. It is also characteristic of modern music to relinquish projection and the perspectives that impose pitch, temperament, and chromaticism so as to give the sonorous plane a singular thickness. And this is sort of intimating an expressive consistency of art that I think is really well understood in the music of Pierre Boulez, for example. And they cite, in terms of talking about this sonorous plane with an irreducible thickness, they speak of the rise of timbre in Stravinsky and Boulez. And this in its own, we could, you know, we could talk a lot about, but there was this famous change that happened in classical music composing with Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. And there's this famous part at the beginning of The Rite of Spring, which focuses on this percussive quality of mixing together the strings and the French horns, among other instruments, into these very dissonant chords. But by Stravinsky looking at the sort of unique, sonorous, expressive capabilities of each of these instruments, when they actually come together in an orchestral setting, it sounds completely different than if you play it on a piano, and it actually works pretty well in terms of creating an expressive, percussive timbre. They continue by speaking of the proliferation of percussive affects with metals, skins, and woods, and their combination with wind instruments to constitute blocks inseparable from the material. And they cite Edgar Varese here, but there are all sorts of modern additions to classical music that focus on water percussion, for example, in which you have a bucket of water and you have percussion instruments that kind of get dipped in and out of the water, and the material properties of the sound creation gets emphasized in a way in which we create properly metal or properly fluid affects. They also speak of the redefinition of the percept according to noise, to raw and complex sound. And they cite John Cage here. Not only the enlargement of chromaticism to other components of pitch, but the tendency to a non-chromatic appearance of sound in an infinite continuum. And they cite electronic or electroacoustic music here. So there is an irreducible, pure expressivity here of these changes in classical music, for example, which is, you know, if you listen to any of my intros and outros and the varying music I use, you'll know that I love classical music. But there's all this variety here, which involves a sober gesture of looking at the expressivity of materials and creating something that doesn't resemble anything that we've experienced before. And in doing this, we confront chaos in a way which somehow is able to transmit the chaos. Now, in the conclusion, From Chaos to the Brain, they're basically summarizing what they've been talking about here by talking about what is the brain, and specifically they're using it as a way to talk about the self or the mind, something that isn't reduced to material, just like, you know, even, even though the brain is, of course, a material question, it gives rise to non-material affects and percepts, you know, in the form of perceptions and feelings and moods, experiences, memories, all of those are non-material, you know, you're not going to reach into your brain and be able to find the memory of your eighth birthday party or whatever. And the way they're talking about the creation of the brain, just like in the case of art, it is a question of using materials, but it is nevertheless not reducible to those materials. When talking about the brain, and really, you know, we can talk about this with art too, they say it is always a matter of defeating chaos by a secant plane that crosses it. So this secant plane is a plane of construction and creativity which is unique 
to each of the three things that has been talked about in this whole work, philosophy, science, and art. They elaborate, it is as if one were casting a net, but the fisherman always risks being swept away and finding himself in the open sea when he thought he had reached port. They continue talking about here D.H. Lawrence. People are constantly putting up an umbrella that shelters them, and on the underside of which they draw a firmament and write their conventions and opinions. But poets, artists, make a slit in the umbrella. They tear open the firmament itself to let in a bit of free and windy chaos, and to frame in a sudden light, a vision that appears through the rent. So really, art and philosophy, too, introduce a nugget of untamable chaos. It is a way to give us access to a realm beyond that of human reducibility, of commonality to something we've already experienced before. It forces us to come outside of ourselves. And one of my favorite examples of this in art was one that Deleuze and Guattari mentioned in A Thousand Plateaus. It's Giotto's St. Francis receiving the stigmata. And it's such a weird-looking painting. I mean, you've got, you know, of course, St. Francis there. And you've got Christ here in this, you know, position of like he would be on the cross. But he's this sort of like half-bird. I mean, obviously, it's supposed to be a, a cherubim, I believe, or seraphim, or however you pronounce it. But, you know, it's this crazy animal apparition that links to St. Francis via these lines which connect him to non-human extremities, to non-human pulls. So strangely enough, in this piece of Christian art, we have a very profound post-humanist statement being made about the ways in which art pushes us outside of ourselves. They continue here on page 204, if art battles against chaos, it is to borrow weapons from it, that it turns against opinion, the better to defeat it with tried and tested arms. Because the picture starts out covered with cliches, the painter must confront the chaos and hasten the destructions so as to produce a sensation that defies every opinion and cliché. How many times? Art is not chaos but a composition of chaos that yields the vision or sensation, so that it constitutes, as Joyce says, a chaosmos, a composed chaos, neither foreseen nor preconceived. So the goal here with art, and with philosophy as well, is to make chaos expressive. As they say here on page 205, Art struggles with chaos, but it does so in order to render it sensory. And that chaos, of course, like we've said, is all sorts of non-human becomings. So art makes the non-human sensory in a way which doesn't reduce to the human, like in science or logic, but pushes us to become animal, become cosmos, become music, all, all these becomings that Deleuze and Guattari love to talk about. So I know there's a lot in here. I recommend that you read this work. It's very, very interesting, um, particularly the first half of this work is exciting, and then, you know, that last part where they're talking about art and chaos. The stuff on science and logic I purposely went over in very slim details because I don't understand it very well. There's a lot of language of which I have had zero education on. But I hope this has helped you to understand this text. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, or critical theory, or gender theory, or German idealism. Join the channel for $5 a month, and join a monthly private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.